Welcome to the very first SI Aerospace Report. I'm your host, Small Stars, and I'm very pleased to represent Space Intelligence's worldwide network of experts, photographers, and creators, bringing you the very latest in spaceflight news from around the globe. Let's strap in and launch right into it. CEO of SpaceX, Elon Musk, recently shared a record-breaking Raptor engine test result. It reached a chamber pressure of 330 bar without exploding. He also mentioned that the next Raptor prototype already has several upgrades over this one, so it seems that we can expect even more in the near future. To put this into perspective, one bar of pressure is very close to one atmosphere of pressure, which is approximately equal to the Earth's atmospheric pressure at sea level. 330 bar on a Raptor produces around 225 tons of force, or half a million pounds of lift. The higher the combustion chamber pressure, the higher the engine thrust and efficiency will be. The added efficiency gained by a higher chamber pressure reduces the amount of propellant that'll be burned to gain the same amount of thrust. This means additional payload capability for the Starship, and these new boundaries being broken by the SpaceX team is a bigger deal than most people realize. In Florida, SpaceX's 11th flawless Starlink mission was launched by their seasoned booster, B1049.6, from their Cape Canaveral launch pad, Slick 40. This widens the gap to other potential space internet service providers even more, bringing the total number of Starlink satellites to just over 650. The booster, which had already participated in the first prototype Starlink mission along with Starlink missions 2 and 7, has now launched and landed for the sixth time, which marks another new record. Congratulations to Elon Musk and the incredible engineers at SpaceX. After the launch, the booster arrived back in port and here are some great photos from our Space Coast photographer, Zach Shaw. You can clearly see the marks the six launches and re-entries have left on this SpaceX veteran booster. We hope to see it fly again. The first Starlink speed tests are coming in, and they seem promising with pings in the low double-digit milliseconds along with reasonable upload and download speeds. Everyone at SpaceX is super excited for the Starlink network to be successful and provide high-speed internet across the whole world. Meanwhile, in Boca Chica, Texas, SpaceX's new Starship facility is a whirling anthill of activity. After serial number 5's beautifully successful 150 meter hop, it was rolled back to SpaceX's mid-bay for post-flight inspections and maybe even repairs in the unlikely possibility that SpaceX decides to reuse SN5 for future flights. Right afterwards, SN6 made its appearance on the launch pad and performed a successful pressure and cryo test. SpaceX crews have already installed Raptor engine serial number 29, and on Sunday, August 23rd, they performed a successful static fire. The static fire should be followed by another 150 meter hop that's scheduled for August 28th. Our fantastic photographer Carlos Nunez surprises us on a daily basis with his artsy shots, and even Elon Musk commented several times on his great images. Some people believe that this foundation here will be a launch pad for the Super Heavy booster. However, others speculate that this could be a water tower that will be used for the deluge system for both Starship and Super Heavy launches and development. This issue was heavily debated in the space community, so what do you think? Be sure to leave a comment below and discuss further. Alright, now looking forward to the next prototypes in development, serial number 7.1 will be reused exclusively as a pressure tank to test SpaceX's new stainless steel alloy. Work on serial number 8 continues, with work crews toiling away on its aft thrust section. Serial number 8 is planned to be the first Starship test vehicle to fly to higher heights, and therefore should be the first Starship test flight vehicle to support a nose cone and canards, which is a fancy aviation word for those body flaps. Twitter is all abuzz with the concept renders, and everyone is super eager to see this amazing hardware take to the skies for the very first time. Now let's talk about Rocket Lab and their imminent launch. After the last in-flight mission failure, which resulted in the loss of the payloads, Rocket Lab is resuming its launch activity. The next Electron is already upright on the pad, but Rocket Lab has not yet announced a mission name or payload, which is highly irregular. Earlier this month, owner and founder of Rocket Lab, Peter Beck, teased the aerospace community with a photo of their first rocket booster that's been engineered with reusability in mind. At first, the booster won't be caught, but will splash down gently in the ocean. Later this year, we should start to see the first in-flight helicopter catch attempts, which is planned to happen sometime in late November-December. Meanwhile, progress on the second pad at Launch Complex 1 looks good, and Rocket Lab will soon be able to do back-to-back -back launches from their New Zealand Mahia launch site. 
Moving on to ULA, their Delta IV Heavy launch is just around the corner. It will carry the National Reconnaissance Office's secret NRLL-44 mission payload, and this will mark ULA's 29th mission for the NRO. It will also be one of the last Delta IV Heavy launches. There are only four more planned after this one before the Delta IV Heavy gets retired. Speaking of ULA, Blue Origin is making engines for them. The CEO of ULA, Tori Bruno, recently stated that there's still a problem regarding the engine's turbo pumps. He's confident that the problem will be solved soon. ULA will use these engines on their next generation Vulcan rocket, replacing the Russian-made RD-180. The Blue Origin-led HLS national team has delivered an engineering mock-up of its crewed lunar lander to NASA Johnson Space Center. Being 12 meters, which is 40 feet tall, it's an impressive piece of hardware, and we're curious about how the lander will progress. What do you think? Will we see it on the moon? Let's take a look at what's happening in other parts of the world. The European Space Agency finally launched their triple passenger mission on an Ariane 5, which was delayed several times due to bad weather. The rocket lifted off from French Guiana and marked Ariane 5's first launch since the lockdown. It was also the first time an Ariane 5 put three payloads into a geostationary transfer orbit. Two of the payloads were telecommunication satellites, and the third was a space tug, or MEV, which is short for Mission Extension Vehicle. The MEV will be used to extend the lifetime of Intelsat 1002 by docking to it and correcting its course. Next up for Ariane Space will be Vega's return to flight mission on September 1st, after a failure last year. Let's move on to the Russian side of things. The Russian Nauka module for the International Space Station arrived at the Baikonur Cosmodrome last week. The module will undergo final electrical checks and preparations including external outfitting before final flight certifications. The cycle of control checks and pre-launch preparation for the module will take about nine months, after which it will be launched by a Proton-M rocket to the Russian segment of the space station next year. Construction of the Angara launch complex continues at the Vostokny Cosmodrome in Russia. The work is currently centered around compressed gas systems, with the launch table as another major element under construction. There will also be a barge transport system for cargo delivery installed along the Amur and Zaya rivers to Vostokny, which will be completed in September. The launch complex will include a launch pad, the central building for the launch control center, kerosene and liquid oxygen storage, and a water reservoir, plus other systems. The next Russian rocket launch is expected to happen in September. Moving on to India. After a forced lockdown, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, finally resumed their spaceflight activities and all launch facilities were reopened. But still, many missions are now delayed or on hold. The director of Vikram Sarabhai Space Center gave an update on the readiness of the two upcoming PSLV missions, which are expected to launch in September or October this year. Taking a page out of NASA's playbook, the ISRO recently announced they will support private Indian space companies to develop launch vehicles, satellites, and other space-based technology. This program will be called InSpace, and we'll keep you covered on that too as the story develops. And last on our list, but certainly not least, China's National Space Administration has been very busy. They're moving forward fast, and we can expect to see a lot of progress from the country's private sector as well. China just successfully launched the fifth Gaofen 9 Earth observation satellite and two other secret military payloads on a Long March 2D rocket into a predetermined sun-synchronous orbit two days ago. The next launch is expected to happen within two weeks. We're truly witnessing a new era in aerospace. Not only governmental, but the private sector is booming as well. It's already hard to count the numerous startups around the globe. We should soon see humans back on the moon, and SpaceX's plans to get us to Mars are making real progress. A big thanks for tuning in to our very first SI Aerospace Report, and please don't forget to like and subscribe for more space intelligence each and every week. If you want to get a daily dose of cutting-edge updates, go to Space Talk 101 and join us on Facebook, where our team posts topical information.